What kind of world do I want to live in? I think about this question a lot. For our generation and for specifically my group of people, which is refugees, the circumstances might dismantle any vision of the future that we have. You're trying to rebuild, you're trying to make a future for yourself, and then the climate related disaster comes and you start again. It's not about how it's affecting you now, it's about how it's affecting you your entire life. First step to understand is that we're all a part of it. None of us are going to be left out by the crisis. We're at a stage where if we don't act now, really there won't be very much left. There are generations that will never see certain things that we grew up seeing in real life. We have to start treating this like the emergency it is. To achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we have to go from an intention to a serious commitment. Business leaders really need to rethink how they conduct their business and invest in creating systems that are climate friendly. The action I would like to see is accountability. Structures being put in place where countries aren't just asked to do something, but they're kept accountable to the decisions that they make. There has to be that strong collaboration between government, between corporations, between youth activists to drive change forward. The world I would want to live in is a world where imagining the future is not a privilege. I want to live in a world where people do not give up on hope, hope that a positive change is possible. The fact that you're listening today means that you are willing to make a change. Welcome. My name is Quentin Palfrey. I'm the president of the International Digital Accountability Council, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's session on well-being with precision consumption. We have a terrific panel for you here today. Really look forward to this exciting conversation. Um, so non-communicable diseases, uh, also known as NCDs, uh, such as heart disease or cancer, chronic respiratory disease and diabetes, are the leading cause of death worldwide and represent an emerging global health threat. Deaths from NCDs now exceed all communicable disease deaths combined um, and kill about 41 million people each year, equivalent to seven out of 10 deaths worldwide. Even worse, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrates the massive threat that an unhealthy population can pose to modern societies. Um, the good news is that advancements in technology, data, and personalization now offer transformational potential to tailor products and solutions based on individual biological profiles um, to achieve sustained well-being. So imagine a world where every consumer, every patient has access to personalized health information to help manage his or her own nutrition, physical activity, sleep, stress, disease management enabled by precision technologies. This powerful combination of personal data, artificial intelligence, and the internet of things um, can really help us uh, to tackle this serious challenge. But new frameworks are required to navigate some of the challenges that are related to personal health information, and especially equity uh, and data sharing. So in today's session, we'll explore the role that precision technologies can play in improving well-being and the operating and governance models that we need to navigate the challenges related to personal information, equity, and data sharing. So we have a terrific panel here today, and I'd like to take a moment uh, to introduce uh, some of uh, my colleagues on the panel. So Ali Mastashari is the co-founder and CEO of LifeNome 
which is a precision health AI company that leverages biological, physiological, and behavioral data to hyper-personalize needs assessments and wellness interventions across a number of industries. Paige Motes is the head of global sustainability at Dell Technology, um, and uh, Dell um, is, of course, a global leader uh, in this space. Uh, Paige is the head of corporate sustainability um, and is responsible for strategic vision and stakeholder engagement. Her work includes deep collaboration to advance sustainability programs, to foster innovation, to drive engagement within Dell Technologies Global Enterprise and with key external partners. And I'm particularly pleased to be here today with Stefan Verhost, who's the Chief Research and Development Officer at the GovLab at NYU. He's been a pioneering leader in this space for many years. I have the, had the opportunity and the pleasure of collaborating with him on some other projects. Um, he's the co-founder co and Chief Research and Development Officer of the GovLab. His research considers how advances in technology and science can be harnessed uh, to create effective and collaborative forms of governance. Um, so it's a real treat to be here with the three of you here today and later uh, with um, Erica Alessandrini, um, who will introduce uh, as part of the fire starters. Um, but let's begin um, with you, Paige. Um, Dell's done some great work on the future of connected living. Um, and I want to give you an opportunity to describe what you're seeing in terms of the advancements and the evolution of new capabilities like precision technologies um, and to help us understand how we're likely to see humans and machines interacting in the future in this space. Well, thank you, Quentin. And, um, you know, I think you said it well that the, the world was already headed in this direction, but I think that COVID-19 has forced a real change to the way we work, the way we interact, the way we approach key issues, especially given how it's further exposed concerns related to vulnerable populations around the globe. And if there's one silver lining we've seen uh, is the emergence of a connected, intelligent world. Things like 5G, advanced computer science, uh, elements like artificial intelligence, machine learning, virtual and extended reality. All of these and many more technologies are helping us do more than we previously imagined. Uh, I think the goal here is to really leverage emerging, emerging technologies and rapidly accelerate that human-machine partnership, uh, primarily to drive higher levels of productivity, but also that work-life harmony. Um, you know, things like taking over repetitive tasks, allowing for modeling to occur in a more rapid way, practicing before doing uh, delivering much more at the exact point of need to solve the exact right problem. Um, but in order to achieve this uh, future, you know, humans must lead also with caution, right? We have to think about things like data privacy, algorithmic inequality, um, and all of those considerations to ensure that these technologies are operating truly in service of all humans um, and not some humans. And so that's the place where that you know, human-led, technology-enabled conversation needs to, to come to play. Um, but the future is, you know, connected living. It promises extraordinary things. Data, huge advances in processing power, software, all of these things are really converging to create a new chapter in this conversation around technology-led human progress. And precision technologies are great examples of that convergence. Thank you so much, Paige. Uh, Ali, I wanna bring you in here. Um, as a technology startup that's using AI and machine learning to improve health, what are the roles uh, that precision technologies specific, specifically can play to improve well-being? What are you seeing? Um, thank you so much for the time. Um, and, you know, building on one page is saying there's the issue of technology, there's the issue of inclusivity, and the two go very much hand in hand. Uh, but the uh, main really advances are in the fact that we now have DNA-based technologies that allow us to understand how a person might process different nutrients, react to different kind of um, uh, skeletal responses, or even be able to predict uh, the onset of predictive uh, of, of, of chronic diseases way before they happen with 75 to 80 percent accuracy if we have enough data. Uh, so we have genomics, we have microbiomes, we have uh, advances in wearable data, uh, 
there's a lot of data right now that wasn't available 10 years ago, and that really drives the ability to pinpoint not just the needs of an individual, but also what interventions, what products, and what services would contribute to the individual's health and well-being. Um, the, uh, one of the main things that has emerged in, uh, our re in recent years is people's distrust of companies uh, to keep their data private. So uh, the emergence of other technologies such as blockchain have allowed us with the ability to kind of think about new ways of storing data. And I think uh, Stefan is going to talk about also governance models that will then combine with these technological advances allow us to create the trust that's necessary uh, for individuals to be able to um, kind of get access to this data and get access to the amazing benefits that uh, Precision Health has on preventative well-being. So that's a wonderful transition. Um, it's just perfect uh, to the transition for Stefan. Stefan, I'd love to get into some of those governance models. What do we need to do here uh, to promote responsible data stewardship, um, to put in guardrails uh, in terms of governments, governance and oversight um, to make it possible for us to unlock the transformational possibilities of these new technologies um, while while uh, retaining a sense of trust uh, and making sure that we're facilitating sort of responsible data use. Yes, um, thanks so much um, for having me. And uh, as Ali was, was already referring to, we do need to not only innovate in how we access data for precision, Cons uh, precision insights, but also we need to innovate how we govern the way we go about this. And I think uh, it's important to take a step back and reflect on what is needed from a data perspective in order to actually deliver insights that are customized and that are, uh, to a large extent, precision. And obviously, A, it needs uh, an aggregation of data, meaning one data point won't give you the insight that is needed. Quite often we need big data and small data together in order prov to provide the insight that is needed to be pre precise and to be customized. And that quite often means that we need to have access to data that one doesn't have. And so that means automatically that we need to set up new partnership models, which we call data collaboratives. And those data collaboratives need to be governed in a way that indeed provides trust on how the different parties and partners will either provide access or have access to the data. So that's one challenge that where we need to have new organizational governance structures. And that could be, for instance, an oversight board, it could be an ethics board, could also be an, a, a trustee board for that matter, that really tries to oversee how the parties and the partners that provide and access data are uh, acting. The second, uh, very briefly, uh, uh, area where we need governance innovation is in the reuse of data, because we not only need access of data that others might have, we also need to reuse the data that was collected for one purpose for another purpose. And that turns out to be, from a governance point of view, a challenge, because most areas in data governance start from the purpose specification principle, i.e. you can only use the data for the purpose for which it was collected. And surprise, surprise, when we talk about precision, we quite often talk about reusing the data. And that's where we need, from my point of view, a new um, uh, way of going about this, which we call data stewardship. And specifically, we need a new profession, i.e. chief data stewards, that can really navigate how do we reuse the data in a responsible way, but also in a fit-for-purpose way, so that we don't start to reuse data for all purposes, but only for the purpose for which we and ultimately have specified uh, as a reuse uh, purpose. And that requires uh, a more sophisticated way of thinking about governance that requires, from my point of view, a new profession, which we call data stewards, Quinton. That, that's a really great way of framing it. So I had the opportunity, the honor to work in the uh, White House under Barack Obama. And uh, one of the initiatives that we were developing uh, about a decade ago was the Blue Button Initiative. Uh, and part of the goal of that was to give patients access to their own health information um, and try to de-silo uh, some of the pockets of information related to an individual patient 
in order to empower them uh, to work with their providers and uh, uh, across uh, the lifespan to be able to manage some of the data here. And it does seem like there are governance interventions that are required um, to unlock uh, the potential um, of these data and to allow uh, for the data sets to match. Um, at the same time, uh, there are other threats. Um, there's the threat of data misuse, um, and there's the threat that the fear of data misuse, of uh, violations of privacy, of cybersecurity, um, and of general lack of coordination um, can undermine uh, the willingness of uh, patients and providers to participate in these systems. Um, so governance is needed, I think, to uh, make uh, the affirmative uh, data sharing possible um, and also uh, to protect it. Um, so Paige, I wanna bring you back in here. Um, so tell me how you think about um, what we can do to architect uh, some of these kinds of solutions and um, how we can overcome uh, some of the challenges that Stefan's talking about. Well, I think, um, you know, developing a solution with the real problem in mind is half the battle, right? And sometimes uh, all of us get into a perspective where we want to lead with the technology and figure out a way to retrofit that technology to the problem. And what we found, and, and a lot of folks have found, is when you really, really understand the solution, you've really engaged on the front lines with, I'm sorry, not the solution, the problem, you really are going to do a much better job of thinking through all of these pitfalls and uh, orchestrating a solution that is much more effective, you know, and it, it has a lot to do with partnerships, uh, right? Because I think that when you're trying to create a partnership from a silo, you're not going to be as inclusive in the outcome. Um, an example of that, um, you know, in the public private space is, you know, similar to what um, uh, my pan fellow panelists are, are identifying. You know, Dell has worked with uh, both the local, state, and national level uh, governments in India, along with the phil philanthropic wing of Tata, called Tata Trust, to create something called digital life care. It's precision-led technology uh, around healthcare, specifically for non-communicable diseases that, that um, was spoken about earlier. And really understanding where the vulnerable populations are really understanding the problems that healthcare workers and uh, doctors and nurses were experiencing, really understanding how it's not just about screening for non-communicable diseases, but the entire continuum of care and what the hurdles are through each aspect and each phase of that, through screening, referrals to specialists, diagnosis and creation of a medical uh, you know, intervention plan, and then management of that plan. All of that is for naught if it's hard for the individual, the patient to manage this, um, you know, their diabetes or hypertension long-term. So, um, you know, I think one way in which you can overcome some of these, you know, pitfalls is to really, really map out who are the most vulnerable populations, what are the most, um, most salient concerns relative to the problem statement, and work in a public-private um, multiple stakeholder analysis to get to the right solution. And what we found is when we did that, um, this has been going since 2013, uh, now uh, tens of millions of people in India have signed up for this. And with this partnership through the broader healthcare services offered in India, it allows for many more people to be able to leverage this capability. Um, people that are not near the city center, but out in, in rural villages that otherwise may not have had access to healthcare. But had we not gone and visited those villages and understood where the concerns were, it would be very hard to create a solution that now is at scale. Thank you, Paige. Ali, I want to bring you in on, one, on, on something that Paige mentioned a moment ago, which is the question of uh, algorithmic uh, discrimination, how we make sure that as we scale these technologies, we do so uh, in a way that's equitable, in a way that doesn't perpetuate and deepen uh, some of the civil rights challenges that we see in this data space. I just sort of wonder how you think about that. 
Yeah, this is a very tough and challenging issue. Uh, one of the issues that we actually have is for health data, we don't have representation. So basically a lot of the health data we have is from white males um, within the population. A lot of health policies are based on that. So the first uh, point of that is, can we have, uh, think about it, that an AI algorithm only learns based on the data available. And if we don't have data representations from the populations that are um, actually at risk and have um, a lot more vulnerability within our data sets, it's much harder to create policies or structures or science that somehow takes into consideration their needs. So the first thing is to make the availability of the basic data that is required for personalization, that data needs to be representative of um, every single uh, population that's uh, within, uh, within our societies. And it needs to include uh, data on not just on like biological data or physiological data, but data on equity and access and understanding all the different societal issues that individuals are uh, confronted with. So once we have a data set or data sets that are unified, that are representative of the population and have measure many, many different aspects of our being, we can then train the AIs on something that's more representative, something that's more equitable. Otherwise, uh, we will end up with biases, no doubt, with, if we kind of stick to the populations that we have. To give you an example, there's a project called All of Us, um, by the, uh, basically by the U.S. government to collect data on genomics to kind of akin to what we have with the U.K. Biobank in the United Kingdom. And that project is striving to get minority uh, participation, and it's very hard to get that, right, because people don't trust to give their data to the government. So there's so many different aspects that need to be overcome for that equitable access uh, that uh, it's, it's a huge challenge. It's a very, very important challenge. Thank you, Ali. I mean, we've talked a lot about trust here today. It's one of these things that sort of keeps coming up. Um, and I wanted to, Stefan, sort of bring you back in to, um, to ask for you to sort of expand a little bit on how you think about data stewardship, accountability, oversight. What guardrails can we put in place to ensure um, that uh, these these data are being handled responsibly, particularly as we scale up? The, the organization I run, the International Digital Accountability Council, sort of works as a watchdog to identify some of these risks and challenges and try to um, empower patients uh, and, and other consumers with some information about how their data are being used. But at scale, sort of how do we think about um, creating policy policy solutions that enhance trust um, as we go further and further into this sort of data-rich world? Yeah, um, not an easy question, but uh, obviously I think uh, every day, uh, frankly, we are getting smarter about how to do this uh, because we're actually learning from practice as well. And I think uh, there are a few takeaways from at least uh, recent uh, efforts. Uh, with regard to your question on guardrails. And I think the first one actually goes back to, Quentin, when you were talking about the blue button, where you anyway, at least identified the need to prevent misuse, but also to prevent misuses. And I think uh, uh, being crystal clear on what is the, what do you try to prevent, but also what do you try to do with the data uh, actually instills trust. Uh, and it also shows that access to data is not just uh, for um, anyway, any purpose, but it is for a well-defined purpose that can benefit people. And I would, uh, uh, that's the first kind of real important insight is that when you def define and design guardrails, you also have to do so in a way that actually doesn't generate opportunity cost for doing good as well. And I think that's uh, a key takeaway. The second one is really about um, thinking about risk across the data lifecycle, meaning clearly we are talking about access to data, but uh, risks exist at the collection stage, it exists at the processing stage, it clearly exists at the access stage and sharing stage, and then obviously uh, um, I think Ali was already referring to the risks that exist when you actually start analyzing some of the data that might not be representative. But then also there are risks in how you actually start using uh, the data. And so having a data lifecycle approach to the risks that exist 
um, is an important one because too often we get obsessed quite often about one element of the data lifecycle and ignore the full data lifecycle risk uh, uh, equation. And so having a, a good risk assessment uh, is a first start uh, across the data lifecycle. And that also means, by the way, that you need to understand why was the data collected in the first place and who determined, because coming back to some of the discussions about equity and uh, inclusion, who determined actually why the data was collected in the first place and, and what were the questions and who defines the questions uh, for which the data was collected is in itself already quite often an issue of equity because too, too often the ones that can benefit are not part of actually defining the question for which the data was collected. And I think starting there would already instill trust uh, on then how we will use the data later on because they were part of actually defining how the data was collected and why it was collected in the first place. And then the third thing, and then I will stop, Quentin, because this is obviously a, a multi-layered uh, question that you have. But I think the third thing that we need to take into account is how do we get a social license for reusing the data once it has been collected? Because as I already mentioned, quite often we are using data that was collected for one purpose for another purpose, which quite often means that we are not really informed by consent uh, uh, and not really uh, informed by at least uh, um, an understanding among the data subjects on how the data will be reused. And that requires an additional step from my point of view, which is a step towards acquiring social license. And here at GovLab, for instance, we have created a citizens assembly, which we call the data assembly, to really start deliberating about what is your expectation with regard to reuse of the data and how can we inform those reusers by actually people's expectation, but also co-creating the guardrails, as you described, in a way that actually instilled trust because they were part of the process in determining the conditions under which data was accessed. And so these are just a few ideas. Uh, Quinton, there's a lot more, of course, to be done here. But I think we're getting, uh, we're getting smarter about how to do this. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we have all the solutions in hand yet. Thank you so much, Stefan. So we're approaching the end of our of our session. I want to give a lightning round opportunity uh, for each of the three of you just to say one thing we need to get right um, as we seek to scale this up. Uh, I'll give you each a, a last word, um, and maybe we'll start with you, Paige. I think I'll build on what Stefan said, um, but taking it broader on technology overall, not just data, the people that are designing these programs need to be more diverse and inclusive themselves. Uh, that will make all the outcomes better. Representation matters, absolutely. Ali, um, your, your last uh, intervention here for the time being. Uh, particularly as it regards to the private sector, I think uh, the shift from the traditional mindset of competition to one of collaboration for human health is extremely important. So the fact that uh, human health, unfortunately, does not understand market competition and market share, uh, in order to achieve it, we really need to collaborate together. There's still profit to be made through that collaboration. This idea that competition is the only way to profit is actually the uh, kind of a fallacious idea and actually data sharing can enhance the pie, can enhance the things that can be done through collaboration. So if my takeaway, collaboration as a shift in mindset with regards to private enterprises. Wonderful, thank you. And Stefan, uh, last, last word from you. What, what do we need to get right here? Well, I will build upon Ali that data collaboration is the name of the game from my point of view, but it is not easy. And we really need to work towards having data collaboration become more systematic, going beyond the pilot, sustainable, really thinking about what's the cost and benefit structure, and more importantly, responsible. And if we would have systematic, sustainable, and responsible data collaboration, then we would actually be able to scale uh, the efforts that we discussed today, because that's uh, these are the three ingredients that quite often are missing. Thank you, thank you. So that's it for our web stream. I wanna thank all three of you, Paige, Stefan, and Ali. Uh, you've given us some great perspectives. Uh, wanna thank you all for joining. And also, uh, more importantly, for all you're doing uh, to leverage technology and personalized data to advance well-being. 
Uh, this is an important uh, piece of the work uh, that the forum is doing here. And so uh, for our forum par partners, uh, please stay on and we'll have uh, some further discussion with you. But thank you all for this great discussion.